every August, Gary Witzenberg and the Michigan State Alumni Association put on Cars on Campus, held right on the campus of Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan. It's a show you should try to catch. My name is Gary Witzenberg. I'm from here in East Lansing, where Michigan State is. I'm the chairman, founder, chief instigator of this madness called Cars on Campus. And this is the fifth year we've done this. Fourth is an invitational concord. One thing we're going for here is a variety. It's an eclectic diversity of cars. We try to get a lot of mix of things. They're not all just the most expensive, the most elite, the most elegant, or the most high performance. They're also you know, so we have some ordinary cars here that people don't see very often, nicely preserved or nicely uh, restored. And the idea is we want people to come here and see just what I said, cars, I haven't seen that in years, I haven't seen one of those since I was a kid, I've never seen one of those in some cases. So we, we think we have a pretty good mix, from the full classic like the Duesenberg to, you know, a Ford Falcon Ranchero, for example, or, or there's a 49 Ford that's just a beautiful car, but it's just a plain sedan, but you don't see them that often that nice. Good afternoon, my name is Bill Adcock. This is a 1912, it's a delivery car. They built these in 1912 only. They, they built 1,845 of them. The bodies were built in Toledo and then shipped to uh, Dearborn where it was assembled. And they were, they were so expensive that Henry Ford killed it after 1912. And so these were the only the brass versions of that car. I think back in maybe 17 or 18 or 19, they brought back another van delivery style car. And that's what they did. If you looked at the side of this car and it says Angus's uh, meat pies, and we bought it from Angus. And he had this meat pie business in Seattle, and he used to put a little, um, a little warming oven in here, and he would go to fairs and sell his pasties. Uh, we bought this one in Seattle, Washington a few years ago. It didn't look quite like this, but it was in pretty good condition, and we've uh, brought it back up to the condition it is in today. And we've had a lot of fun with it. We've been to a couple concours and won a few awards. My name's Bruce Dundas. I'm from Hope, Michigan. And uh, this car is a 50 series Buick 1931, which was the smallest Buick made at that time. And this car was actually one of 75 built for export. And it had a right-hand drive and hydraulic brakes, which was unusual for a Buick that year, and it was shipped to Uruguay. Uh, all mechanical parts had to be changed. Everything that was mechanical on it was literally destroyed because they cobble things up so in South America. The front axle was broken. It had an altogether different type of rear axle than what belonged on it. The spindles were smaller than the wheels, so they'd stuffed them with uh, with the shim stock and forced the wheels on so the wheels were wobbling all over the place. And so it, it was quite a challenge. Big old straight eight? Yep. But uh, it's about a two, what is it? 220. 177 horse. Cruising speed 65. Being a sport roadster, you had to have a place for your golf clubs. This is the mother-in-law seat. <laughs> well, it always seems like it'd be kind of a challenge to step there and there to, you know. Yep. And the trunk was an original Buick accessory because it has the Buick tags on it. quite a challenge for me since it's the first time I tried anything like this. 
But we've had a lot of fun with it. We enjoy it very much. My name is Jack Scaff, S-K-A-F-F. I'm from Flint, Michigan. But starting it is rather interesting because it starts so easy. From the seat, you wouldn't have to get out. And to start it, you have to tur turn the ignition on. And uh, and it catches. There. And there are two speeds forward and one reverse. And uh, I can demonstrate that a little bit. Back is like this. I always say I take the dog for a walk, you know. This was called the speeder, which is the accelerator. This is the brake. And uh, this is a compression release so that you can crank it easily. Another interesting thing about it, it steers with a tiller. But people look at this original bell that was on the car. And they say, well, what's that Nazi signal being on there? And, it, and you say, well, because it, it was the original bell. Well, that isn't a Nazi signal. That's an Indian sign, and it's in the reverse of the Nazi. And uh, it stands for good luck to the Indians. This is the bulb horn. And the lights run by kerosene. How many horsepower? What it's six and a half horsepower. It's supposed to go 28 miles an hour. And they used to advertise nothing to watch but the road. And because you could just look over the edge. Ladies and gentlemen, the oldest car in the field, 1902, a hundred year old automobile by none other than Oldsmobile. It's a chain drive. Do we have brakes, Jack? Yeah. 1902 Oldsmobile. The first car sold new in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Would these be the original size tires and wheels? Original wheels. The wheels were made by C.S. Mott, and that's a name we all recognize. Oldest car in the field, 100 years old. My name is Dick Sharon, my wife Jackie. Uh, we bought this from the original owner. 1922 Ford TT truck. It's got the uh, worm gear rear end in it, so it's only got, it'll only go about 23, 24 mile an hour. What did you have to do to restore it? Then? Oh, just about everything. It was in pretty bad shape when we started on it. it Built all new rack. It's the same as it was originally. And, uh, all new sheet metal on the sides and everything. Redid the fenders and the rest of it. They're all original. That was on the thing. And uh, overhauled the engine. But had to buy new tires for it. Of course, the tires were all gone and all the wood was rotted out. And we had to build all new, it's all hard maple, which I'm not sure that's what the original wood was in it, but Henry Ford used all hardwoods. So it probably could have been maple or oak anything. It's a Fields cab. It's kind of cute. The original owner told us they bought this cab because uh, it had a door in the front on this side. The Ford cab had both doors in the rear and you hard to get in and out of. So they bought this one. When we restored it, the door on the other side still had the original screws and the hinges. The door on this side had great big long screws in it. They'd replaced them <laughs> dozens of times it looked like. But it was quite a quite a project. Well, actually, uh, 
not that many months, but a lot of hours from about April to November it took. But I, I guess we, the two of us together, we got like 3,000 hours in it. So. Thank you for showing it to me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Hi, my name is Claude White, and my car is a 1941 Cadillac Series 62 two-door convertible. I uh, bought the car in 1982. It was in very deteriorated condition. It had been sitting outside for a number of years. There was a lot of body rot. Uh, the interior was bad. Where the fenders joined the body was rotted out quite badly. We had to have a number of parts made for the car. Spent five years obtaining parts, making parts, and then started a 10-year restoration. Uh, the car has, as you know, a 1941 Cadillacs. It had a V8 engine. It was uh, 346 cubic inches. 150 horsepower, and uh, if you are interested, later I can pop the hood and I can show you the detail under the hood. The car's been completely refurbished, all new glass, interior, chrome, engine rebuild, trans rebuild, uh, new rubber. Uh, my friend who helped me work on it, I'd like to mention his name, David Dahlin, uh, excellent, excellent craftsman. And in addition to being a good craftsman, he could get me started on things and give me some guidance, and then he could go off and work on other areas. So. With his help, uh, the car got finished. Without his help, it probably would have never happened. <laughs> okay, this is the car as we bought it. We bought it in downtown Detroit. And as I say, it had been sitting for some time. It actually looks better in the photograph than it was. When we took it apart, well, first off, you can see there's a heavy coat of dark gray primer on it, which was to hide a lot of Bondo and other bad things. But when we took the fenders apart from the body, we could see that we needed to replace a lot of metal. Uh, first thing we did was sandblast it to get rid of all the bad metal and then uh, we had to start over and make new pieces. Uh, the body was put up on a rotisserie. We turned it upside down. We replaced uh, sections of the floor panel. We were able to form the metal to have the right ridges and everything so that when we ground down the weld to where it was flush with the rest of the panel, it looked totally original. Um, frame was painted, the underbody was painted, uh, and started the long process of reassembly. Had to get the fabric from uh, a shop which I believe was in the Carolinas and uh, they sold us uh, a large roll of Jenkins rubber and, and uh, interiors and uh, it was a perfect match. I had sent them a small sample of what was still available and uh, they did a perfect job on the match. So I did all of the interior myself on the uh, trunk, uh, had to make new panels. There's some little thin metal tabs that support the panels on the interior of the trunk and on a lot of cars, especially convertibles, that part was broke off. Fortunately, on this part, they were intact, so I was able to put them back together exactly as they left the factory. The hood ornament is also the release for the hood. Big engine. This was the engine that Cadillac used from 1938 through and including 1948. And also, this engine was used in the tanks during World War II. They actually used two engines and two transmissions and they had one set up for each of the tracks, and it was a 40-ton tank, but with that arrangement, it allowed them to turn in a very, very short turn radius because they could cut the fuel to one side and accelerate the other side and, and make rapid movements. Uh, this is the last year that Cadillac, or for that matter, any other motor company, had the uh, thermostatically controlled radiator shutters. If you look close, you'll see that there are, are radiator shutters here, and what that does for you is it allows you to get instant heat on a cold morning when it first starts up, there is no airflow through the engine, through the radiator, but as it comes up to temperature, this pulls the shutters, the louvers open, and then you get normal airflow. Uh, and this particular series of engines from 38 to 48, they had the oil bath air cleaner. Uh, this engine also has a large oil capacity compared to modern cars. It takes eight quarts of oil. You'll notice the tip of the exhaust pipe is uh, porcelainized, and that's the way all 41 Cadillacs were as they left the factory. And uh, I might add that not only does it look nice, but it maintains a uh, cool temperature. I could be running the car for some time and the uh, exhaust tip will feel warm to the touch, but not hot. Nineteen fifty three Packard Caribbean straight eight. 
1963 Studebaker Avante. 1970 AMX by AMC. Uh, my name is Daryl Salisbury. I'm from Portage, Michigan. This is a 1970 AMX in Big Bad Green. It's a 390 GoPack car. I bought it new on December 30th of 1970. It has 12,600 original miles on it. Most of it's original, some of it's been replaced just because of age. It's got some very rare options. It's got a heated rear window, which is very unusual. It's got a rally pack, which is very unusual. And it's got a rear seat speakers with a fader switch and an AM FM radio. A very nice performance car, my baby. How did you get lucky enough to get the AMX personalized plate? Took me else? seven years, oh, but I got uh, it. This <laughs> is great. It's a 390, 325 horsepower, uh, functional Ram Air. Very nice. V8 Studebaker Commander, 19. I want to say 62. <laughs> Hudson Wasp, early 50s. This has got twin H power. My name is Dale Miller. I'm from Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, this is a 1952 Hudson Wasp. It's a two door hard top. They only made around 2300 of this particular car so it's quite rare there aren't many on the road today this is only one of two I, that I know of in the state of Michigan I bought the car in Topeka Kansas back in 1990 and uh, I restored it in my shop at home it took me five years blood sweat and money to get it to looking like it does now the clock and the speedometer is the same size How's this for driving on a freeway? Good. Uh -huh. Yeah, I drive it 65 and 70 miles uh -huh. an hour. Uh -huh. Okay, this is a 308 cubic inch uh, inline six cylinder engine. It's uh, what they call a 7X engine, which was prepared uh, in the early 50s for the NASCAR circuit by uh, the Hudson factory uh, under the direction of Marshall Teague, who was a famous uh, NASCAR racer back in those days. This class right here is rod and custom. This is a 1955 Oldsmobile Holiday. And they, across the grill here, it says, Some Doll. In the back, side of some party doll here. 1955 Chevrolet Bel Air. Tops lowered. Nice car. Nice tail light treatment. Thirty-three Buick model. 90. And the V8 in the Buick. 33 Studebaker Commodore. Nicely lowered. 1926 Ford Track T. Obviously, this is not a a Model T engine here. Nineteen forty six Ford Coupe. Chopped top, French tin headlights. Custom grill. Lake pipes on the side. Nice taillight treatment.
can buy them for 12, 14, 15 dollars. 1936 DeSoto Airstream. Looks body wise pretty much original. 1940 Ford Standard. Nice, nice coupe. In the interior, nicely done in gray. Good afternoon, my name is Grace Gluck and uh, my husband and I, uh, Bob and I, own this car. It's a uh, 1947 Cadillac, model 6267X. The X stands for power windows, and it's an Antoinette blue, if you can't tell. It's, it's not black, it's a very deep blue, which is with a, an original color. It has uh, a red leather interior, and with the tan top, and the uh, red piping around it, with the chrome strips on the back and forth, uh, back in the front and the back window, which was an original part of the car. And then it has the trim ring. This particular car the, uh, has an Antoinette color around the trim. And uh, in this particular color with the Antoinette blue uh, was the only color that could go on the wheels. This, this particular color car did not have red trim. Lincoln Continental. Just beautiful flames. This is done by the art god, Glary, Gary Glynn from Lansing. How was your tour on Bay Harbor? This has been lowered so much that you can notice the guy walking behind it. It's waist high to him. Of course, he's like over six foot tall, but it's still top's been chopped. Nice headlight treatment, and it's right down close to the ground. And a little different tail light treatment. No, not that. 1967 Ferrari 330 GT. 1967 Jaguar E Type. 1970 Jaguar E Type. Nineteen fifty eight Triumph TR three. Nineteen fifty one Jaguar XK one twenty Le Mans. Nineteen seventy Ferrari two forty six GT Dino. Nineteen fifty MGTD. Nineteen forty nine XK one twenty Alloy Roadster. Nineteen fifty six Austin Healey one hundred M. This is a it was not sports racer. It has the slide down window windshield. Nineteen sixty MGA. Yeah, yeah. 
1963 Ford Shelby Cobra. And the engine from the Cobra. My name is Bob Messenger and I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is a 1948 Lincoln Continental Coupe. They made the car in either a coupe or a convertible, which was called a cabriolet. This was the last Continental until 1956 when they brought out the Mark II. I've owned this car for 32 years. I did the car in 1970, repaint, reupholstered, and re-chromed it. It's the original color. The interior is done as it originally came from the factory. It has won all awards for the Classy Car Club. It has won the Ford Motor Trophy Award for the best post-war. Uh, it's been on seven national caravans, including Nova Scotia, and it has a V12 cylinder engine in it. I drove down this morning from Grand Rapids. I drive it 60, 65. It's got overdrive. If you take it out of overdrive, this screams bloody murder, but in overdrive, that engine cuts in half. Wow. But that's exactly how it would have come from the factory. And same way inside. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. It's just a beautiful And uh, two years ago, I finally had to rebuild the engine after owning it 32 years. So, but, how, how many miles are it? Well, it had 50 when I got it, so it's probably got about 85,000 now. Uh, my name is Nick Chapakis, and we're from Saline, Michigan, which is just out, outside of Ann Arbor. And uh, I bought this car brand new in uh, 1959, and I had the, my first date with my now present wife. When the car was three weeks old, ten, and day, ten days, ten days old, and it had 300 miles on it, and uh, we've been together ever since. But you, so the original owners, you've had, so have you had to do much to restore it or anything like that? It's unrestored. It's got 125,000 miles on it, and it still runs good. The engine's never been touched, and we drove it up here on I-96 at 70 miles an hour, and here we are. Uh, the starter system on the 59s and earlier Buicks and later Buicks was in the accelerator pedal and it was activated by a mercury switch on the carburetor. You merely turned on the key and pressed on the accelerator to the floor and it would start. Uh, it's been a very unique starting system and a lot of the young kids when they get in it they're trying to wiggle the key to get it started, they just can't figure out how this car starts. So it is really, really a unique system. It was used on Packard and on Cadillac for a while. Uh, well, the thing that fascinates people the most is the tail fins. Uh, they, they don't, they've read, read about tail fins and of course the 59 Cadillac had the largest tail fins. When I bought this car in 59, I was contemplating buying the Cadillac, but every time I looked out the rear, I thought there was a car following me too close. So I went with the 59 Buick because the fins did not stick straight up. Uh -huh. But you still, were, when you look in the rearview mirror, you can see that fin kind of in the little corner. Yeah, in this the, car, and you're sitting in the driver's seat, you can see all four corners of the car, oh, yeah. which makes it easy for parking or maneuvering into tight spaces. Uh -huh. uh, on all 59 GM uh, products, the front door skin was the same, whether it's a Cadillac or Buick or Yeah, they, or the old. 59 was, uh, the Buick, developed the design and GM took that front door of the Buick and used it on every make of their cars from Cadillac all the way down to Chevy. Yeah. The same door skin. Yeah. It's just the little alterations with chrome made look different. As you can see my seats are kind of shabby because it's never been restored. But like I said it's a car we drive all summer long and really enjoy. Uh, hello, my name is Bob Horatio from Southfield, Michigan. Uh, I'm standing next to my 1960 Buick Electra 225 convertible. Had the car 10 years. I bought it from a guy in Cleveland, Ohio. First Buick I've ever owned. Uh, the car was uh, originally assembled in Atlanta, Georgia and came up through the south and was uh, restored in 89 in uh, Ohio. The car has many options, uh, some were quite unique for the time. Uh, 
Right here we have the uh, Twilight Sentinel. It's an automatic headlight dimmer. There's a bunch of wires goes underneath the dash to a, a metal box about the size of a cigar box that has vacuum tubes in it. And as you approach a car, the lights will, like they do nowadays, dim or you know stay bright or dim automatically. But this was just uh, the infancy of that, hence the vacuum tubes like in the old televisions. I don't believe they were very reliable. One guy asked me, he says, does yours work? I said, no. He says, well, I'm not surprised because they never did after they left the dealership. So uh, the car also has air conditioning, power windows, and uh, just about every option there is. That was for, and this was factory air? Yes, factory air. Fairly rare, I think. And that, that, was, that Wildcat 440, that refers to the torque, right? Correct. Cubic inch. Yeah, it's a 401 cubic inch. But they use whatever bigger number they could. Yeah. <laughs> and it has a, turb a twin turbine uh, Dynaflow transmission, which is very smooth. You, no shifting involved. It just, just keeps going and going. You wait for it to shift, and it never does. Very smooth. And it's just been a lot of a wonderful, fun car. This is Class L Fords, 49 to 76. And this is a 56 Thunderbird. And the guy has the window sticker off from it. This car listed for $2,800 out the door. V8. Beautiful color also. 1962 Ford 500 Galaxy. Or Galaxy 500, I mean. Damn. 51 Ford F1 V8. This is the old flathead. Fifty Ford four door. Fifty three Ford F one hundred. This also is the old flathead V8. 57 Ford Skyliner. This was the hardtop convertible. Uh, this is a 1923 Nash uh, model 698 four-door coupe. It, uh, the car is an unusual car because the trunk is part of the body. Uh, back in the 20s, you could buy a rack and strap a trunk on it for your sedan, but Nash is the only car company that built the, the trunk as part of the body. Uh, coupes had trunks back then and sedans didn't, so when they put the trunk on it, they call this a four-door coupe. Uh, we finished restoring it two years ago. Uh, my son did all the paint work and I did all the mechanical work in the car. The car still has the original upholstery in it, except for the front floor covering and the rear floor covering. But all the, the seat uh, and the door panels and uh, the headline is all still original. And the window shades in the back end. These steel disc wheels were uh, uh, an option uh, with Nash that year. They were a $27 option, otherwise you got wood spoke wheels. The wheels are made by Bud Michelin in Cleveland, Ohio. Their manufacturing date says July 1923 on it. So this is original interior? It's all original interior. Um, Car has a rear seat heater in it. It has a, a dome light and reading lamps in it. Uh, I have the original sale brochure for this car and it says the bud vase is silver. It took me seven years before I found it because that's the one thing that was missing in the car. Uh -huh. uh, and like up there, what all... Uh... That's the windshield wiper motor. Uh -huh. That's a vacuum operated wiper motor. And. Uh, I don't know if you see the little spotlight over on the right hand side of the windshield. Uh -huh. that, that was made it high class. That, that, when you had a spotlight in a car back then, you were really something. Do you get, is this, how's this car for driving on the road? Do you drive it much at all? Uh, oh yeah, I've driven it, uh, well since it's done, I've driven it about 200 miles on the road. Uh, if I have to go real far, I trail it because uh, you can't compete with modern traffic otherwise. 
Would you like to see the engine? Yes, please. Okay. There's an overhead valve six. Uh, they tell me it comes at 248 cubic inches, which makes it a pretty good size engine for its day. Uh, one of the things that uh, is unique about this, this little elbow, you can turn it around and hook it into the carburetor, and that's how you get carburetor heat in cold weather. There's a, two valves in here that directs exhaust gas through here and heats uh, the upper part of the carburetor. In the summertime, you, you just turn it around because you don't need the carburetor heat then. And it has this own little oil can up there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. all, all the, the fittings on the car are lubricated with oil. There's no grease fittings on the car at all. How often do you have to oil those? Oh, I use 90 weight gear lube in it and I probably oil them once a month. They says daily if you're driving the car every day, but uh, uh, I don't drive it that much. And I think I got better oil today than what they had back then. One of the things that's unique about this uh, engine, it has a genuine Delco gear reduction starter from 1923. I always thought that Chrysler invented the gear reduction starter back in the 60s, but Delco had that way back in the 20s. And it works very well. <laughs> Three times I've been out on the road and somebody says, hey, your stoplight doesn't work. They're not looking for anything that says stop in green, you know. Exactly, yeah. Oh. Well, thank you for showing us the car. Okay, you're welcome. And the winner of Class C is a 1923 Nash. Is this a beautiful green Nash or what? And it's, uh, it's a 698 model four-door, and it's owned by Raymond Host from Warren, Michigan. Congratulations, Raymond. Raymond, congratulations. The trophy sponsored by OnStar. And here's Lori to present the trophy. This is a stunning automobile. Everybody's commented on this. The paint job, the, the disc wheels, the butt bases in the back. Ray, it's magnificent. You don't see many Nashes around, especially this striking. Hi, I'm Rick Mills. Uh, this is my 1957 Nash Ambassador Custom. Uh, I've owned it for about nine years. I uh, just got it back from being restored uh, this spring. The car is rather interesting. It has three-tone paint. Uh, it is uh, avocado metallic, black stripe, and Mojave yellow roof. Uh, 1957 was the first year with a V8, uh, AMC produced at uh, 327, their own uh, production. Uh, fairly deluxe car, this is the Custom. There was also a Super, which was the uh, lower model uh, full-size car. Uh, it has... Uh, a few interesting features. Uh, one of the odd ones uh, that everyone always is uh, famous for, or Nash is famous for, is the uh, interior, which uh, converts into a bed. Optional equipment available were window screens that would snap in place of the windows, and you could also get uh, roll-up mattresses that you could unroll in the interior. Um, so it was billed as America's finest travel car. <laughs> so that was uh, kind of their little thing. Um, as you can see, fairly extravagant uh, interior, had a dual speaker radio. Uh, Nash is also well known for their ventilation system, which uh, has a actually filtered uh, air system that the air comes in through the back of the hood, through the cowl vents, uh, goes through an air filter, and then down through the uh, heater core. Uh, this car, I believe, has 53,000 miles on it. Um, it was in decent shape. Uh, Nashes are unibodies, and they have a very strong tendency to rust. Uh, so these are very rare. Uh, I've only seen another one in about 20 years of going to car shows. Nash used a hydromatic transmission, but they threw their own little uh, trick into uh, starting the car. Switch the key to on. Point out again, it's the lever, the transmission lever. Yep. Transmission uh, lever, you pull it back towards you to start. Uh, tube radio, takes a while to warm up, but works after that. Uh, interesting backlit dashboard, of course it's not going to show up very well right now. The uh, letters are cut into the back of the plastic, so when it lights, the light catches in the numerals. Uh, glove box drawer. 
which is extremely large. But My name's uh, Larry Miller from Plymouth, Michigan, 1957 Oldsmobile, 88. I bought it in 1988, came out of Columbus, Ohio. It's got uh, just under 52,000 miles on it. Uh, power steering, power brakes, 371Q, four barrel car, automatic. Uh, it's even got four-way power seat in it, which is kind of rare. Uh, it's, the stock color is called Rose Mist. They had quite a few pastel colors that year. It's, it's hard to do, but you can get your hand behind there and actually check the uh, air pressure, but it's not easy. And there's spring clips, five of them on each one. And they just snap in. You'll notice the rim doesn't show at all. Uh -huh. They were optional for 57. Uh, you'll notice the interior kind of matches the exterior as far as the uh, oval of the tail lights in the, in the interior on the dash carry, carries over in there. Uh, this particular interior you could actually get three different colors for the exterior only. Uh, rose mist which this one is, a real light green color called ice green or a beige colored and that's all they offered with this particular interior. The car has the fender skirts and then uh, what's called a continental kit on the back and the Continental kit is actually released by a lever that's between the, the tire and the uh, trunk area. And this, is this is back in the days when they used to hide where you filled the car. Some of the, the Cadillacs especially, the whole tail light assembly would flip up. On this one, it's, this would flip up. This class is Corvettes from 1953 to 76. And this is a 65 Corvette convertible. A 1968 Corvette Roadster. 1961 Corvette convertible. 1957 fuel injected Corvette Roadster. This is more of an orange than red. 1939 Buick Roadmaster four door convertible. 1991 Buick Riata. These were built here in Lansing at the Craft Center. 1949 Buick Roadmaster with wood trim, station wagon. 1968 Buick Wildcat. 1931 Buick Model 94. Hi, uh, my name's Rick Reshi, and this is my 1961 DeSoto. We're from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I uh, actually work at a Chrysler dealer. We'll put a little spot in here. Naylor Motor Sales in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a mile and a half southwest of the stadium itself. Uh, this 61 DeSoto of mine was purchased from the owner, Mr. Naylor, uh, whose dad founded the dealership in 1950 as a Plymouth DeSoto dealer, and that's why he bought the DeSoto. The 61 is the last year of production, and actually this particular car was built the last month of the production in November 1960. One of the very unique things about this car, of course, is the push-button drive, which Chrysler had from the late 70s up into the 60s, and then did away with it altogether. You mean, you mean late 50s? Late, what did I say? You said late 70s. Oh, how about the late 50s and into the 60s? Yes. Middle to late 50s, actually, is when they came out with the push-button drive. Actually, didn't the soda have a little lever on like 55 or something like that? Or was it a yeah, lever? they had a, they had a, tra again, it was on the dash and it, it was a lever that went up and down. Yeah. Yeah. I think they did and, away with that for safety or something. And like they, that. they went away from that and then they went into push button and everybody acclaimed the push button was safe and then they got rid of it. I don't know where, why or when, but, uh, or exactly when. 
Um, other push button cars, I don't know, there's none here. The Etzel had push button in the center of the horn, which was kind of a unique uh, way of shifting a vehicle. Of course, there was originally no seat belts in this vehicle. The seat belts have been added. Those were not original. Have you run into anybody, any other owners of 61 Desoto? To be honest with you, no. There is an, there's an owner of a 61 Chrysler in Ann Arbor. Which is similar, except the grill. Yeah. Uh, there's about, I want to say, 40 of them in the United States that are members of the, De the DeSoto Club, which I am a member of. Um, so there, there are some 61s around in they, varying conditions. So. Did they only build a few hundred, like three or four hundred that year or something? Or I, yeah, they didn't build very many. I th it's short of a thousand. I think it's around more around eight or nine hundred were built. Yeah. Uh, my name is Glenn Baring. This is a 1963 Mercury Monterey. It's the S55 model, which was the top of the line for for that year. Uh, the production number on the two-door breezeway with the power back window was, I believe, 3,863 uh, units. Uh, this is original paint. It's called Pink Frost. It's one of the only uh, seven metallic colors they did that year. It's the original chrome, uh, original unaltered engine, uh, original interior. It has about 82,500 miles on it. It's a real cruiser. It's got the 390, a V8, 300 horses. Uh, I just put a dual stainless exhaust on it and a four barrel engine. It has the original spare tire in the trunk, never been on the ground, never had the blue cleaned off the white wall. Original rubber gaskets, never been replaced. Uh, original trunk mat. Um, I like the gas tank filler door. That's yeah, there. it's uh, unusual. The, um, you can see the interior is all original, door panels are original, everything. Only the S55 had the deluxe door panels, and only the S55 had the bucket seats with the console in the middle. This has the automatic floor shifter, and uh, one of the nicest dashboards I've ever seen on any car. The gauges are really nicely integrated into the dash. They glow uh, green at night, and the inside of the car has seven individual courtesy lights that come on at night so it just lights up like a Christmas tree. Um, it's a real unusual car. People usually don't know how nice 63 marks are until they actually see it. The, I always like the C-pillar, the way they did the C-pillar on this car. The, the Monterey Customs had the three hash marks. If it wasn't a custom, if it was just a basic Monterey, it didn't have any of this. The Customs had this and then if it's an S55, it had that plus the S55. So it's uh, considered the top of the line for that year. Hi, I'm Larry Spicknell, and this is a 1963 Oldsmobile Starfire convertible. There are only 126 of these left in the United States and six here in Michigan. The car is, uh, uh, was the most expensive car that Oldsmobile, Oldsmobile produced for 1963. It is uh, um, the top of the line. It cost more than a 98 when it was, when it was produced in 1962. That's a, it's, it was called an Autronic Eye. Yeah, uh -huh and it is for dimming headlights. Uh, this car has tilt, uh, factory cruise control, uh, factory power vent windows along with all power windows. Uh, it has an, a list of options. There were about 20 options. Uh, not all of them were, were standard on this vehicle. This car has been in the Lansing area all its life. Uh, I found the original dealer. Uh, it was his demo car for a year. And then I went to one other couple here in Lansing they drove it for about 20 years, and then it sat in the, in the garage for almost 20 years. So it was uh, well worth saving with it being a rare vehicle. Fantastic job restoring it. Thanks for bringing it out. Thank you. 1962 Buick Special, convertible. 1958 Buick Century. 1957 Buick Century. 1954 Buick Roadmaster Convertible. 1930 Buick Model 64C. Complete with tool layout. 1963 Riviera. 1928 Buick Master. 1954 Super Riviera. 
This is Chevrolet's Class H, 49 to 76, and this is a 1958 Impala convertible with a 348 tri-power on it, meaning that it's got three two-barrel carburetors. Nineteen sixty-four Impala Supersport. You can put that down. Nineteen fifty-seven Bel Air Chevrolet two-door hardtop. Nineteen sixty-four Chevrolet Malibu. Nineteen fifty-four Chevrolet two ten two-door. Nicely redone. 1969 Chevelle Malibu. Nice two door convertible in a really shiny black. That's the grass reflected there. 1960 Chevy Impala two door hard top. 1955 Chevrolet Bel Air two-door hard top. 1967 Chevrolet Chevelle. 1965 Impala Supersport. 19. 69 Z28 Camaro 1958 Chevrolet Camino this was General Motors first attempt at a really styled pickup 1965 oh, yeah. oh. Corvair Monza. What, I, you think that's the original engine? No, no, it's it's not. Not. no. Sure. Hello, my name is Byron Adams. I'm the owner of this 1971 Citroen 2CV. It's a two cylinder horizontally opposed air cooled engine displacing 635 cc's. They were originally offered for uh, public sale in 1948. They were built almost exactly as you see them here up until the mid-1990s. Uh, the car was uh, cheap basic transportation for the masses for all those years. It has the uh, distinction of having the longest production run of any mass-produced car in the history of the world. Uh, this particular one was built in Paris. Uh, even though it has a steering on the right-hand side, that's because uh, it was originally sold in England. <laughs> was imported by a uh, importer, importer here in Michigan. Uh, he drove it for a year, I bought it from him. Uh, I've owned it for a little over a year, I've done nothing to it, it's just as uh, he restored it. And uh, it's uh, the most fun I've ever had going uh, less than 60 miles an hour. Uh, the car is frequently uh, mistaken for a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, it has nothing in common with the Beetle as far as parts or uh, design features. Its styling is similar to a Beetle only because it was uh, originally uh, engineered and built in that period, so it has that period's uh, styling cues. Uh, you might notice that it is a convertible. All of them were. That saved on metal. Yeah. The license plate is the original British plate that was on the car when it was uh, imported from England, although it has had a slight modification to the lettering. My name is Stuart Packard. This is my 1940 110 six-cylinder Packard. This is what they call one of the junior Packards. In the mid-30s, Packard, to meet the pressures of the Depression, started producing a low-priced car for family use would be available to the man on the street instead of the luxury cars of earlier years. I found this car in 1973 in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and drove it home, if you can imagine. It was not in this kind of condition but it did have the Packard trademark, the Flying Lady Ornament, which most Packards have, and it's a real treasure. The ornament is probably worth half as much as the car, but it's restored. It's not a perfect, or a, one of the deluxe restorations, but it's in presentable shape, and I enjoy driving it, and we have a wonderful time together. 
Thank you. Hello, I'm Ron Richards. It's a 1946 Chevrolet pickup truck. This particular truck came from outside of uh, Cadillac, Michigan, uh, over by Misik. It was used in a gladiolus bulb farm. It was stored in the barn every winter. Uh, so when we picked it up, it had 43,000 miles on it. The only mechanical piece that had to be replaced was the tailgate. Uh, it had to be repainted. The paint needed work, but the engine and drivetrain just needed gasket work. So what kind of engine is it? Right it's inline six. The General Motors used these engines from, as I understand it, the late 30s clean up to uh, the early 60s. Uh, it belonged to Shirt Tail Relatives and my father did most of the work along with a uh, local body shop uh, across the state in Harrisville, Michigan. And now that he's 82, I'm the caretaker, so I take it to uh, things around here because I live in East Lansing, Michigan. Well, I'm Don Morton, the owner of this uh, 28 Gram Page. Uh, one of the first ones made. And it's original, uh, except for the color on the paint. Other than that, it is original. Uh, take it to a lot of Graham Page shows. It belonged to, uh, and I've had it all from oh, all over the United States, really, in Canada, uh, to different shows. I'm Joe Prey, and this is also Joe Prey. We're of Charlotte, Michigan. We have a funeral home there, and that's why we have a 1937 LaSalle funeral coach with the body was originally built by Meteor Motor Car Company out of Pico, Ohio in 1937. Uh, the car is, uh, is uh, of course, the being the LaSalle was the baby to the baby sister to the Cadillac and it does feature the car side panels in the back. Which Our car has uh, been completely restored so that we can use it on a daily basis of which we still do use it once in a while for funeral services through our own funeral home in Charlotte. Yeah. The back and the inside is also finished with carved uh, walnut wood trim on the inside as well as blue cloth oh, yeah. and it uh, like we said it's capable of driving down the road at the highway speeds which is actually very nice to be able to drive it over somewhere here like this. Hi, I'm Katherine Kieser. I'm from Williamston. I have a 1972 442 Cutlass convertible with a 350 engine. It's been souped up a little bit. It's been a fun car to own. Uh, my name is R.H. Berry. The uh, automobile is a 1960 uh, four-door Lincoln Premier. Electric windows and uh, electric seats. Refurbished the uh, radiator, the gas tank, and the power steering and the uh, master cylinder and uh, just about everything else. Yeah, I'm Skip Strong. We're from Grand Ledge, Michigan. The car is pretty much a one-of-a-kind prototype show car. Buick Experimental Engineering built this car for the 1955 auto shows on a 54 chassis. Therefore, it carries a 54 serial number, a 54 data plate. It's legally titled as a 54 but of course being built for the show it looks exactly like a 55. There are a few, two external differences uh, that people won't catch unless I tell them. The grill looks like a 55 grill, it should, but it's made of a thinner material, it has no finished edges, no mounting holes, it's got one less vertical row of column in here, so the grill ornament centers up on a line, in all production cars it centers up on a row. The other difference externally is over here where you can see a paint break of the colors which you wouldn't see on a production car because in 54 they did not try color them 55 they did so in order to do that they had to drop the stainless enough to cover that up and in 54 they used the same block but they did a little fancy work to up the horsepower and whatnot this block was uh, cast a little ahead of midway in 54 production run but it had the 55 improvements on it, uh, including a change of placement of the uh, uh, oil filler vents, for instance. In the 54s, early 55s, the oil filler was out of the valley pan down here. 55, they changed it mid-year, and yet this engine had a modification. We uh, did one thing as a young man, so similar to the first brand new car I ever owned, always wanted a Continental kit, couldn't afford it, so I hung one on this one. <laughs> I'm Dick Northrup, uh, East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, this is a 1975 Eldorado convertible with a white top. 
Uh, I purchased the car about four months ago out of Gladwin, Michigan. It had 18,860 original miles. Everything is original on the car with the exception of the tires. Uh, the gentleman who owned it, 80 years old, replaced the tires with original uh, factory spec tires uh, last fall. Uh, the car is driven on a regular uh, basis. It's uh, recently been in three different uh, shows. It is very unusual. Dunbarton green is the color. Uh, this has a 500 cubic inch engine, V8. It is not fuel injected. They did have fuel injected engines at that time, but this is not uh, one of them. Uh, it runs, uh, drives like a dream. It's a beautiful car, uh, something that I've always uh, wanted. I never thought that I would find a car as pristine as this one. The paint, as I indicated, is Dunbarton and is original. Uh, it's never been uh, touched up or restored in any way. Of course, it has air conditioning on a power windows. Power seat uh, does not have the uh, trunk opening mechanism, which everyone thought was odd. However, it does have the indicator for the uh, tail lights and headlights. Uh, those are mounted on the front fenders and there's also one at the rear, mounted right behind the rear seat that you can see from the driver's side as you're driving the car. Uh, but other than that, everything, uh, say, is uh, standard. Uh, when the car was purchased new, the fiberglass boot was a $50 option. Today, uh, it would cost you $750 to $1,000 just to acquire that feature.